for our session's leads, we welcome back Dr. Darby Kozak as one of our session leads. And join us as session 1B lead, we welcome Cynthia Hunter, who served for two years as lab chief for the Division of Complex Drug Analysis, Branch 1, five years as project manager and method verification program coordinator, five years as Office of Translational Research Records Coordinator, two years as a Federal Acquisition Contracting Officer Representative, and six years as an analytical chemist and biologist. Our first presentation in Session 1B is on oligonucleotides, current thinking, and analytical challenges identified in the Nusenarison PSG development. Our presenter, Dr. Dei Zhang, is a senior chemist in the Office of Research and Standards, OGD, specializing in complex drug substances, including complex mixtures, peptides, oligonucleotides, and polymeric APIs. In his work, he provides scientific inputs for regulatory policy and actively involved in the pre-ANDA meetings, product-specific guidance development on such products, and manages related research activities. Our final presentation in this session is on in-depth impurity assessment of synthetic oligonucleotides enabled by high-resolution mass spectrometry. Our presenter, Dr. Kui Yang, is a senior research scientist in the Division of Complex Drug Analysis in the Office of Testing and Research in OPQ. She specializes in mass spectrometry-based analytical method development. Her research in regulatory science focuses on complex drug product analysis to provide scientific input on drug quality questions. Please join me in welcoming our first presenter, Dr. Dei Zhang. Thanks for the nice introduction. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, wherever you are. Again, I'm De Yi Zhang. It's my great pleasure to be able to present in this workshop on oligonucleotide. As some of you may know that in February 2022, FDA posted the first product-specific guidance, PSG, on a, an oligonucleotide nucleosin. So in the next 20 minutes or so, I will discuss some of our current thinking and the analytical challenges identified from nucleosin PSG development work. This is a disclaimer basically in saying the presentation reflects the view of myself and should not be construed to represent FDA's views or policies. Since this is a workshop, I do have several learning objectives. The first one is to describe oligonucleotide-based therapeutics and the regulatory challenges. The second objective is to understand the agency's thinking in the development of product-specific guidance on nucleosin. The third objective is to describe analytical challenges in oligonucleotide characterization. For the first learning objective, let's discuss some background information on oligonucleotide-based therapeutics. Oligonucleotides are nucleic acid polymers that can act in a sequence-specific manner to control gene expression. Those therapeutic oligonucleotides exert their effect through different pathways, for example, suppression of or interference with mRNA translation, the immune stimulation, protein binding, also induction of axon scaping. Oligonucleotide can target a wide range of mRNAs, which encode all cellular proteins, including those protein targets considered undruggable by small molecules or protein therapeutics. The oligonucleotide-based therapeutics include antisense oligonucleotide, we also call ASOs, 
the small interfering INAs, we call SI INAs. The small hairpin INAs, we call SH INAs. The anti-micro INAs, we call anti-MI INAs. Aptomers, and also others, for example, the messenger INAs. In FDA, the synthetic oligonucleotides are regulated as drugs by CEDAR, but for vector-based or promoter-driven oligonucleotide, they are regulated by CEDAR as biologics. These are the FDA-approved synthetic oligonucleotide drugs by the end of June 2022. There are 14 of them. The very first one is Fermoversin, approved in 1998, which is a phosphorylated antisense oligonucleotide. Then in 2004, Pagatinib was approved, which is a aptamer. Then after some quiet time, we saw a dramatic increase in oligonucleotide drug approval starting from Mapomersin in 2013. I color-coded different categories of oligonucleotides. Early ones were mostly phosphorylated ASOs. Then we saw phosphorodiamidate morpholino ASOs. Now we see more and more SI INAs, especially those GALNAC conjugated SI INAs, which has become an important subfamily of oligonucleotide drugs that are used in different indications. In the last slide, I briefly mentioned antisense oligonucleotide. They are small pieces of synthetic oligonucleotide, generally 12 to 30 nucleotide long, that can bind to specific molecules of RNA by Watson Creek base pairing rules. So in this talk, we will focus mainly on ASOs, but the discussion are generally applicable to SI INAs. Even though there has been great progress in oligonucleotide drug development and approval, we know there are still significant regulatory challenges in this field. I want to briefly touch upon the regulatory challenges on oligonucleotide. Most people already know that there's no ICH or FDA guidelines that specifically address the quality aspect or expectations for the oligonucleotide drug. Also, we know there is no consensus on impurity reporting, identification, and uh, qualification threshold. So that already is a big issue in this field. Also, in terms of impurity characterization, most impurity exists as mixtures of those closely related molecules. And uh, even worse, many impurity co-elute with the active ingredient. We are currently lack of analytical methods to adequately resolve those impurities. For the generic, there are additional challenges for the oligonucleotide drug development. So facing all those challenges, we at the Office of Generic Drugs decided to use product-specific guidance as a tool to help generic oligonucleotide drug development. So next, I want to share with you an example of our work on nucinersin. This brings us to the second part of my talk, the current thinking in developing product-specific guidance on nucinersin. Product-specific guidance provide FDA's current thinking and expectations on how to develop generic drug products that are therapeutic equivalent to specific reference listed drug. This program started in 2007. Now the PHG are posted on a quarterly basis. And as of June of this year, there are over 2,000 posted PHGs. In GLUFA2, which covers physical year 2018 to 2022, 
FDA is committed to posting a PIG for complex product as soon as scientific recommendations are available. For the upcoming GADUFA 3, which covers physical year 2023 to 2027, FDA has agreed to posting a PIG for complex product approved on or after October 1, 2022, 50% two years after NDA approval, and 75% three years after NDA approval. So developing PIG for oligonucleotide will be critical for generic oligonucleotide drug development at this moment. The reason we pick up new synersin for the PIG development is it is one of the first oligonucleotide drugs approved that is still on the market. It was approved in 2016 for the treatment of spinal muscular atrophy. Eucinersin belongs to a phosphoroside or nucleotide family, and it can also serve as an example for other approved ASOs. The brand name product, Spinraza, is very expensive. For a typical 5 mil vial, it costs over $130,000. Key considerations in PIG development include the API sameness recommendation and also considerations on impurity profile assessment, which include product-related impurity assessment and the immunogenicity risk assessment. So the first focus in the PIG development is to provide recommendations on API sameness categorization. But before we talk about API sameness recommendations, let's review briefly how the phosphoroside or nucleotide is generally synthesized. We know that typically a nucleotide is synthesized by solid phase synthesis. For example, in this case, starting from DMT protect nucleoside on solid support, detrituation for the five prime hydroxy nucleoside, coupling reaction with phosphoroamidide in the presence of an activator provides the phosphide triester dinucleotide. Oxidative sulfurization affords the phosphorocyate ester. After capping the unreacted 5 prime hydroxy intermediate, the DMT-protected dinucleotide will be deprotected to get into the next cycle of the synthesis. As many of you may realize that replacement of phosphodiester with phosphorosylate will create a phosphorus chiral center and thus a new pair of diastereomers when you extend the nucleotide by one phosphoroside linkage. In the paper published in Nature Communications, they also performed two comparative studies. When they used a stereochemically pure phosphoroamidide 1 as the starting material and treated with a tetrazole activator, a SN2 reaction should afford intermediate 3, which after reacting with the nucleoside on solid support, CPG means controlled pore glass, it's a solid support, and oxidative sulfurization should afford the dinucleotide as a single isomer. However, they found that they got two diastereomers. They performed a similar reaction starting with another stereochemically pure isomer of the phosphoroamidide 2, they got exactly the same mixture of the two diastereomers of the two dinucleotide. Because the nucleoside coupling step with intermediate 3 or 4 is irreversible SN2 reaction, and the oxidative sulfurization step will not change the stereochemistry. So, based on the result, they observed 
they hypothesize that it is the rapid epimerization at the phosphorus center with repetitive attack of the activator that caused the observed result. Basically, no matter whether they started with phosphoramidite 1 or 2, they always get the same intermediate mixture 3 and 4. So the conclusion were the product diastereomeric ratio is independent of the starting material configuration. And also activator can affect the product diastereomeric ratio. Other research also show that different diastereomers of oligonucleotides have different biological activity or metabolic stability. So based on these literature findings, we recommend that to demonstrate API synthesis for ASO, the generic applicant should show equivalent of test API to the API in the RD in primary sequence, chemical structure, and the diastereomeric composition. Because we know the phosphorocyanate stereochemistry affect the pharmacological property of the ASOs. Also, the reaction condition, including activator selection, affect the phosphorocyanate stereochemical outcome during the oligonucleotide synthesis. We encourage the applicant to use a wide range of orthogonal analytical methods with sufficient sensitivity, discriminating power, and resolving power to analyze API. Some of the possible analytical methods and tools to explore include you can use a mass spec, including the tandem mass spec. You can also use an MR, uh, including the uh, phosphorus MR the liquid chromatography, and also the duplex melting point temperature to a complementary strand. The second recommendation in API synthesis includes the equivalence in physical chemical properties, which include the aggregation state analysis and the high order structure of the API in the product. Some of the methods you can consider include the CD spectroscopy, the differential scanning calorimetry, the size exclusion chromatography, and the sedimentation velocity and a little intro centrifugation. For impurities, we recommend a comparative evaluation of impurity in the proposed generic nucinersin and the reference listed drug. The reason is to ensure impurities in the proposed generic nucinersin product will not alter the safety, including immunogenicity and efficacy compared with the reference listed drug product. For oligonucleotide in general, those impurity analysis and the categorization is very complicated and challenging. Here we recommend generic applicants to contact Office of Generic Drugs through a, for example, pre-under meeting pathway a process for questions related to generic nucinersin development, including questions on immunogenicity and the inflammation risk assessment and the comparability of impurities in the proposed generic product. Even though we are not going to discuss impurity evaluation in details here, I do have some comments for you to consider. For example, for impurity characterization, you should use a range of sensitive and orthogonal methods to analyze impurities, including those co-eluting with API. You should also consider if the impurity level in your proposed generic nucinersin product can be controlled at or below those in the RD. And if you want to group impurities, think about what criteria you would use and remember to provide necessary justification in your application. For the immunogenicity assessment, you should provide a comparative study assessing the risk of 
inducing local inflammation and or thrombocytopenia in the drug product and assess immunomodulatory effect of any impurity that may be present in the product using uh, sensitive assays. Now let's move to the third part of my talk to touch on the analytical challenges in oligonucleotide characterization. The analytical challenge in oligonucleotide characterization can be seen in multiple areas. For example, the intrinsic complex nature of oligonucleotide drugs, including the challenges in API characterization and the product-related impurity analysis, and the limit of currently available analytical tools that can provide high resolving power and sensitivity. These challenges are also intertwined closely. For ASO API, we know it is typically a mixture of a huge number of diastereomers. For example, nucinersin contains over 130,000 different diastereomers in the API. So a full characterization of API, including the diastereomeric composition, is very challenging. For product-related impurities, we know that the possible number of impurities are enormous with diverse structures. For example, you can have the deletion or addition impurities, the N-1 group, N-2 group, N-1 group, and N-2 group. Each group contains many different impurities. For the phosphorosdiate or nucleotide, it can also contain the PO impurities. It may also have the base residue changed impurity. Some base may be lost. You have a basic site. Also, sugar moiety may change as well. What's especially challenging is some of those impurities can co-elute with API. For example, the mono-PO impurity, some of the modified full-length impurities, N minus 1 and N minus 2 impurities sometimes also co-elute with API. Also, you may have isobaric impurity. The deamination product, for example, between cytosine and the uracil nucleoside, or the methyl cytosine and the thymine nucleoside. The mass difference is just one daughter in each pair. In high charge state in mass spec, the related impurity become isobaric impurity that are difficult to analyze. My colleague, Dr. Kui Yang, will present her research in more details in this area right after my talk. You can learn more on isobaric impurity analysis from her talk. Another problem with impurity is the quantification of overlapping impurities. For the analytical tools, the most frequently used method are LC MassSpec and LC MS MS. But there are challenges in applying LC MS in separation and the categorization of the oligonucleotide because of high negative charge in oligonucleotides. For example, the ion pair reverse phase chromatography is the LC method of choice for oligonucleotides. It quite often causes MS signal suppression because of ion pair reagent used in the system. Recently, people also use the hydrophilic interaction liquid chromatography, the helix MS, which become a very attractive alternative method. But the chromographic resolution still need further improvement. So to improve the overall resolution and the sensitivity of the LCMS method, we need more research in this area. Now I have covered all three learning objectives. Let's see how much you have learned on the contents. I have two challenge questions to check on how much you have learned. The first challenge question is, among the different categories of synthetic oligonucleotide drugs approved by FDA, which category is not one of them?
A. Antisense oligonucleotides (ASOs). B. Aptamers. C. Small hairpin RNAs (SHRNAs). And D. Small interfering RNAs (SIRNAs). I'll give you three seconds to choose the correct answer. The answer is C. FDA has not approved any small hairpin RNAs. The second challenge question is, which is not one of the analytical challenges we talk about for oligonucleotide drug categorization? A. ASO drug substance contains huge number of diastereomers. B. Oligonucleotides are big molecules and are not soluble in aqueous media. C. Many impurities are co-eluting with each other in liquid chromatography. And D. Unpaired reversed phase chromatography often cause MS signal suppression. Again, three seconds. The answer is B. Oligonucleotide, even though they are big molecules, they are sodium salt in most of the time and are very soluble in aqueous media. So the B is not one of those we talk about. I hope you got both answers correct. Now let me give you some take-home message. So now we know oligonucleotides are a class of new therapeutics that offer promising treatment solutions to a wide range of diseases, but they also represent a unique scientific and regulatory challenges. We have posted a product-specific guidance on using nursing to facilitate the generic development of this drug product. We also identify analytical challenges during that process, including the diastereomeric composition analysis in API characterization and the product-related impurity analysis and the quantification. We see that we need more research in this area. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge my co-workers and supervisors in the Office of Generic Drugs for their support. Also want to thank my colleagues in the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality for their input in the product-specific guidance development. I also want to thank the FDA oligonucleotide working group members for their input and feedback. I want to thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have in the Q&A session. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for spending time with us and joining me in the oligonucleotide API seminars and the impurity assessment session. I'm excited and happy to share with you some of our work on the FDA-funded research into the EBEPS impurity assessment of synthetic oligonucleotides enabled by high-resolution mass spectrometry. I'm going to discuss with you three objectives. Number one, identify scientific and regulatory challenges unique to synthetic oligonucleotide therapeutics. Number two, understand the in-depth assessment of complex oligonucleotide product-related impurities. And number three, resolve complex structural similar impurities by utilizing high-resolution mass spectrometry. Synthetic oligonucleotide therapeutics is an involving class of complex drugs. It is blooming in recent years by demonstrated great potentials in targeting a broad range of messenger RNAs, including extending the treatment to those previously considered as undruggable diseases. However, its great variety and the unique features, particularly its being in between the traditional large and small molecules, also bring in unique regulatory challenges highlighted by the lack of ICH guidelines or FDA general guidances, 
specifically available for the quality aspect of oligonucleotide drugs. Recently, FDA published product-specific guidance draft for new Sinerson. This is the first ever PSG for this class of drug products. A big step forward for promoting generic oligodrug development. As my colleague De Yi from OGD just discussed in his talk, this draft guidance provides the agency's current thinking on assessing pharmaceutical equivalents with a particular focus on demonstrating API thinness. Due to the challenging impurity assessments of oligodrug products, in the draft, it is recommended that the sponsors contact the agency for questions related to the comparative studies of impurities in their test products. The challenges in impurity assessment result from the diversity of impurities and the depths of impurity assessment needs to go. For example, oligolipotide impurities typically comprise deletion or addition sequence variants and the impurities with modified backbone nucleobases or sugar moieties. Taking the sequence variant impurity class as an example, it can be further classified into families depending on the number of nucleotides being deleted from or added to the intended full length sequence. Taking the N-1 family as an example, it contains members each missing one different nucleotides. The complexity goes on to the next level where although a same nucleotide is missing, it is removed from a different location for each individual component. When an impurity assessment goes to a deeper level, it can offer a more comprehensive impurity profile and promote manufacturing improvement and quality control of the drug products, including generic drugs. The in-depth impurity profiling also informs regulatory decision making by minimizing uncertainties and the potential risks to patients arising from the unresolved or unidentified impurities. The challenges in achieving an in-depth impurity assessment arise from the structural similarities of impurities with API or with each other, to which the current analytical methods often fail to provide sufficient resolution. For example, the conventional LCUV approach may only differentiate the impurities into the impurity families that are separable by chromatography, the more recent LCUV MS approach may differentiate impurities one step further into individual family members by separating coeluting impurities through the added MS dimension. However, there are some special cases that may face greater challenges than others, which I will use the case study to elaborate on in more details momentarily. For the third component level covering individual components that co-elute and have identical masses, we are not going to cover their differentiation today, but I certainly hope we could update you in some future opportunities. In the rest of my talk, I'm going to briefly cover the use of HRMS in identity and the quantitation of oligonucleotides, followed by a case study in in-depth impurity assessment using HRMS to differentiate isobaric impurities that are challenging to analyze using conventional LC-MS approach, and finish up by a comparison of high versus low resolution mass spectrometry in impurity assessment of those challenging cases. Let's first uh, take a look at how high-resolution mass spectrometry can enable confident identity tests of complex molecules like oligonucleotides. 
The cost of synthesized food and product test sample used in the study is the same sequence as new Sinusin and 18 mer modified RNA with a molecular mass over 7,000. Minus 4 chart state was shown to be predominant in our LCMS spectra, both accurate mass and isotopic envelope at the peak distribution of this chart state by HRMS was were used in identity confirmation. We observed a sub-PPM high mass accuracy for both monoisotopy peak and several isotopy peaks as shown on the left panel. The isotopic envelope with well-resolved isotopy peaks on the middle panel and a matching isotopic pattern with expected distribution on the right panel. All taken together, this confirms the molecular identity of the intended fullness product with a high confidence. We also examined the linear dynamic range and the limit of quantitation by HRMS using extracted ion chromatogram. Extracted ion chromatogram of individual isotopic peaks allows the reduction of background signal interferences, leading to improved signal-to-noise ratio. We observed a quantitation limit at low fentanyl column load. In the remaining of the presentation, I will focus on discussing a challenging case that is to resolve co-eluting isobaric impurities. This case study uses to sequence deletion impurities, either missing a methylated uridine nucleotide, the N-U, or missing a methylated cytosine nucleotide, the N-C. Those two impurities, although have different masses, their masses are very close close enough to challenge a confident separation by MS dimension. For example, as shown here, their minus four charged state ions are isobaric to each other, indicated by the identical nominal mass, with a mass difference only in the decimal positions. When those two impurities are analyzed individually, the same confident identification by HRMS as discussed above remains applicable as shown here by both accurate mass and isotopic pattern conformation. However, if we take a closer look, we can see that except the monoisotopy peak, or other isotopy peaks of N-U are largely overlapping with those of N-C, as shown by the overlaid isotopic envelopes. It was also demonstrated by the small mass differences, less than 0.005 Dalton, as listed in the table, calculated from the exact masses of the individual isotopic peaks of N-U and N-C. Will N-U and N-C coexist in a mixture? Although they do elute at slightly different retention times, they are too close to be resolved by chromatography as shown here. Overall, the coexisting N-U and N-C impurities are not either separable by chromatography or differentiable by accurate mass measurements. Therefore, in current practice, most often, they are reported as one entity, without each impurity being identified or quantified. As discussed earlier, the monoisotopic peak is unique to N-U and does not overlap with any of the isotopic peaks from N-C. Therefore, its presence can indicate the presence of N-U in a mixture but it cannot either exclude or indicate the presence of N-C, which, however, can be reflected by either a matching or mismatching isotopic pattern of a test sample with the expected isotopic distribution of the N-U standard. A mismatching, as shown here, would indicate the coexisting N-C with N-U in the mixture. 
A follow-up question is when coexisting n minus u and n minus c is identified, how to quantify their composition in the mixture? Using the isotopy peak distributions of individual n minus u and n minus c standards in green or purple bars on the top panel, we calculated the predicted isotopic distributions of their mixtures at the different compositions by their linear combination, showing by the orange bars on the bottom panel. We also measured the isotopic distributions of those mixtures experimentally, showing by the blue bars. We observed very small differences between the predicted and the measured isotopic distributions, which verifies the accurate prediction of isotopic distributions of a minus U and minus C mixture from the isotopic distribution of individual standards. With that, we designed a workflow showing in the scheme to quantify the composition of isobaric N-U and N-C in an unknown sample. A predicted isotopic distribution at a variable composition X% percent was fit with the measure that is also the targeted isotopic distribution of the sample, iteratively until the best match was reached. The best match was defined by the smallest difference between the predicted and the measured isotopic distributions. Next, in order to test the method accuracy, we prepared a set of N-U and C mixtures at different compositions, covering 5 to 95 percent range. The compositions quantified by our approach demonstrated an accuracy within plus minus 5 percent deviated from the true composition for the entire range as shown in this figure. And next, to test the method sensitivity, a 1 to 1 N minus U N minus C mixture was spiked to the custom synthesized new Sinerson fullness product test sample. The spiked amount covers a four-order magnitude, for example, from as low as 0.4 femtomol up to 2 picomol of total N minus C and minus U on the column in the case of a 2 picomol column load of the fullness product. We found that the isobaric composition was not accurately or reliably quantified until the spiked amount reached 0 0.02 picomol or higher on the column, as yellow highlighted in the figure, which defines the limit of the method in quantifying isobaric compositions of the mixture. Lastly, we examined the, op the application of the method in quantifying the coexisting N minus U N minus C impurities per present in the custom synthesized New Sinerson test sample. The total amount of the N minus U N minus C impurity present in the test sample was first quantified by using extracted ion chromatogram. From the quantified amount 0.27%, we predicted that a minimum sample column load of 8 picomol would be required to meet the limit of at least 0 0.02 picomol of total N minus C and minus U on the column for reliable composition quantification. The experimental data confirmed that, as predicted, reliable compositions were reached at a sample column loads of 8 picomol or greater, as shown by the right bar of the figure. While data points greatly scattered at the sample column load below 8 picomol, as shown by the left bar. 
I would like to finish up by a brief comparison of the analytical capability of high versus low resolution mass spectrometry in addressing challenging co-eluting isobaric impurities. For high charge states like charge state minus 4 discussed here, well, low resolution MS would only provide a single peak with an average mass. HRMS is able to provide an isotopic envelope with well-resolved individual isotopic peaks. Well, low resolution MS has to group N minus C and minus U. HRMS can identify the presence of either N minus U or N minus C only, or they're coexisting in a mixture. Finally, while low resolution MS can only quantify to the level of the sum, HRMS can go one step further to quantify individuals in the mixture for an index impurity profile. To conclude, today we discussed the synthetic oligonucleotides are an evolving, promising class of therapeutics, but do pose unique scientific and regulatory challenges. We also discussed that um, why the in-depth impurity assessment is crucial for promoting comparative studies and what in-depth impurity assessment can offer. And we demonstrated the advantages of using high-resolution mass spectrometry to adjust the resolution of challenging impurities by using co-eluting isobaric N-1 impurities as a case study. I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the generous supports from both the Office of Testing and Research and the Office of Generic Drugs. The financial support from FDA critical pass grants and the great variety of expertise and the cross-office collaborations we have at FDA. And thank you so much for your time. Before I close out, I have two challenge questions for you. Number one, which of the following statements is not true for synthetic oligonucleotide therapeutics, in short, ONTs. A, ONTs target a broad range of messenger RNAs. B, like messenger RNAs, ONTs are regulated as biologics by FDA. C, currently no ICH regulatory guidelines specifically address quality aspects for ONTs. D, FDA published the first PSG draft guidance for ONTs in 2022. The answer is B, different from messenger RNA products, ONTs are regulated as drugs by CEDAR at FDA. And question number two, a true or false question. In-depth impurity assessment by HRMS is recommended in PSG draft guidance for new seniors published in February 2022. A, true, B, false. The answer is B, false. In the draft PSG, the sponsors are encouraged to engage with the agency if having questions related to the comparative studies of impurities for their test products. And thank you again, and I'm happy to address your questions and the panel discussion. Thank you for the great presentations. As a reminder, if you haven't had a chance to enter your questions, into the Q&A chat pod, please do so now. We'll answer as many questions as time allows. Joining us on the Q&A panel, we welcome back Dr. Daniela Vertheli, and we also welcome Dr. Lycan Liang, who serves as the OPQ Chair in multiple reviews of various generic 
the oligonucleotide product development meeting requests and contributed to the development of the published draft product specific guidance on nusinarosin sodium intrathecal solution. Looks like we have some questions coming in right now and the first question will be addressed to Dr. Dei Zhang. And here is the first question. When is it expected that product specific guidance for oligulant nucleotides will be published? Yes, yeah, thanks for the uh, nice question. Um, I already talked about uh, why we choose using nursin as the first oligonucleotide drug product for PhD development in my talk. Uh, we do plan to continue to develop PHGs for other oligonucleotide drugs, for example, uh, other antisense oligonucleotides and uh, SIRNAs. So I would suggest you to check the FDA website on upcoming product-specific guidance for complex generic drug product development for oligonucleotide drug product PHG development plan. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We do have another question for Dr. Zhang. And here is the question. Could you elaborate on what is meant with local inflammation for nucinarison impurity assessment? Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. Um, it, it's kind of a general term, um, you know, because the injection, um, Sometimes you do see injection side is local inflammation, um, but that's kind of a, uh, you know, uh, overall immunogenicity, everything related. So I probably want to ask uh, Daniela, uh, who is an expert in this field to uh, chime in. Daniela? Hi, Sergi. Exactly. Um, sorry, I, I missed that question. Can you repeat? Hello. Uh, this is a moderator. I can reread the uh, question that we just sent to uh, Dr. Zhang. He was wanting you to comment on something, but I'll reread the question. And here's the question: Could you elaborate on what is meant with? Local information for Nusinersen impurity assessment. Local inflammation or information? Inflammation. Oh, okay. Yeah, so in general, um, we expect oligonucleotides to have an immunomodulatory activity um, in, at the site where they are deposited, whether it's sub Q, YM. Um, or whatever the inoculation site is. And it's important to understand what the impact is on local inflammation, on the activity of innate immune cells. Um, different impurities in the products can elicit different immune profiles and they can modify the activity of the oligo, um, the therapeutic oligo. So we, we will usually ask for um, that type of characterization. Thank you for responding to that question. Moving on to our next panelist, we do have a couple of questions that came in for Dr. Kui Yang. And here is the first question for Dr. Yang. For quantification by IP or PLC in co-eluding impurities, how do we take into account ion suppression differences and ionization inefficiencies? Uh, thanks for the question. That's a very um, ex excellent question. Um, for the um, uh, co-eluting impurities, um, the suppression and uh, ionization efficiency are very uh, critical. We should take into consideration 
when uh, we do quantitation of co-eluting impurities. Uh, for adjust the suppression and ionization efficiency difference, um, the traditional way uh, you can use is to synthesize the impurity reference compound and then you can test uh, uh, the impurities for their ionization deficiency by using those synthesized reference compound. And then you may uh, use a uh, correction factor or the ways we're commonly used for uh, their uh, quantitation. Um, we do understand that it's impossible to synthesize all um, those impurities you are going to uh, quantify. Um, in that case, uh, those representative uh, synthesized impurities um, should, can be uh, used for their quantitation and also for uh, those uh, structural similar impurities. Um, so so uh, basically, um, to evaluate the, the uh, suppression deficiency, uh, suppression difference and ionization difference, using synthesized impurity to validate your method. Um, that is very critical. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We do have another question from Dr. Yang, and here is the question. How can we quantify IPRPLC isobaric impurities such as 3,5 inverted ones? Uh, thanks again uh, for this uh, excellent question. Um, so in the case study uh, we talked about today, uh, isobaric impurity, today we're using uh, N-C, N-U as our case study, and they are co-eluting and also their mass are very close. So uh, the, the approach we're using is uh, using their isotopic distribution um, to differentiate them and to quantify their uh, isobaric ratio. Um, for the, for the uh, case you're mentioning in your question, uh, if they can be separated by chromatography, um, you can uh, validate your master, your LC UV master for their quantitation if they can be separate. But if they do co-elute, and their mass are either very close or same like the case uh, invert ones or the positional isomers we mentioned in our presentation. For that case, the isobaric, uh, isotope di uh, the isotopic distribution cannot work for their quantitation. And you have to think about different ways. One way you we may be able to uh, consider is the tandem mass spectrometry. So you may um, test their um, MSMS to see if any, any fragments that are unique to those uh, impurities that co elute ha and have the same mass. Um, if, uh, if MSMS can give you unique fragments for those impurities, then you may um, validate your LC MS MS approach for their quantitation. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. Moving on to our next panelist, we do have a couple questions that came in for Dr. Daniela Vertheli, and here is the first question for Dr. Vertheli. How can we detect drug tolerance in an assay? Thank you. That that is a, a, a good question, and it's always a, an issue um, whether there is interference of the drug um, in an assay or not, uh, and that you know, usually can be tested quite simply um, by really characterizing your response to the stability standards that you choose to use uh, for the assay, and then establishing acceptance criteria, establishing that your assay is reproducible. And then after that, you can, you know, test your 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 assay in the presence of drug and really determine whether there is um, any interference that is coming um, from the 
from the drug, whether it's interference or enhancement and with oligonucleotides, um, there's always a concern that there's going to be synergy between the different sequences or, or different um, potential agonists uh, in, in result in a change of pattern response or an enhanced response. Great question. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We do have another question for Dr. Verthaley, and here is the question. Can concanovalin A be used as system suitability control in raw and the TR, TLR2 cell line? Huh. Um, thank you for the question. So, so concanovalin A or carnelio, how it's uh, more usually um, thought of, is, is really a, a mannose and glucose binding lectin um, that's from jack beans, right? So. Uh, one would expect that it would like, bind to a TLR2 and, and give a response. And in that sense, it can be used um, with certain TLR2 expressing um, cell lines. Um, however, I would, I would caution you on two accounts. One is that um, you, you may want, if, if you're using something like a raw cell or a cell that expresses multiple uh, receptors, you may want to explore how pure the concavalin A that you are getting your hands on is um, and, and make, you know, and, and qualify your reagent to, to make sure that you are actually detecting a, a TLR2 response. Um, the other thing that I, I would caution is that CONA is a very potent um, agonist and it is known to, for example, cross-link T cell receptors and, and do other things to the immune system. So, if you are using something like a PBMC for the assay or a more complex system, I, I would be a little bit wary of using CONA as you will, it'll be hard to tease out what mechanism you're looking at. Again, very good question, thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. Moving on to our next panelist. We do have a couple of questions for Dr. Lichen Lang. And here is the first question. How can we completely assess diostereomeric sameness? Uh, thank you for this really, really challenging question. Um, unfortunately, currently there's no, not a single method that can completely, you know, assess the uh, diastereomeric uh, you know, composition sameness, especially for the uh, more complex ones such as the new Sirison, uh, due to its, you know, huge number of diastereomers. Um, so uh, the agency published a draft uh, PSG uh, on new Sirison, which actually have some recommendations on the approaches and strategies uh, in addressing the diastereomer. Uh, composition sameness challenges. Um, typically, uh, for the test products, um, uh, the applicant should use, uh, you know, a, a broad uh, range of orthogonal uh, analytical methods uh, with sufficient sensitivity, uh, discriminating, and resolving power. You know, for some analytical methods, um, small change in the chromatographic uh, profile does not necessarily uh, mean small change in the diastereomer uh, composition. You know, so you got to be careful. Um, you cannot say, okay, uh, the HPLC has very small change. That means uh, the diastereomer uh, composition are the same. And also, in in general, um, the risk of uh, in diastereomer uh, composition sameness may be lower if uh, you use uh, equivalent synthetic route in conditions as those of the ROD. Uh, this would include the activators and other factors that may impact the diastereomer uh, composition. And you can also uh, measure the RPSP configuration ratio during your synth synthesis to get some idea of your analytical method, whether that can, you know, 
detect those changes because uh, during the synthesis, uh, those ratios can be easily measured. And then you can look at your final product and see whether your analytical method is sensitive to those changes. Um, so, um, and then uh, also alternatively, you can, you know, uh, kind of using a negative control strategy that is to change your manufacturing process uh, to, to the extreme conditions, trying to see whether that would have some impact on the RP-SP ratio, and then use your analytical method for the drug, uh, uh, the, the finished uh, API, to see whether your analytical method is sensitive to those changes. So again, uh, there's not a single method that can, you know, uh, resolve this issue currently. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We just had one more question that came in. We've only got a couple minutes left for Dr. Lang. And here is the question. What are the agency's recommendations with regard to setting impurity limits for oligonucleotide drug products. Thank you again for a really good question. Yeah, um, there's no uh, FDA guidance currently on the thresholds or the limit for oligonucleotide related impurities. Um, I say it's Q3A and Q3B are not applicable to oligonucleotide related impurities. However, they are applicable to other process impurities, such as those small organic impurities from the activators, so on and so forth. Um, the acceptability of any proposal on the oligonucleotide related impurity thresholds or specifications would be uh, reviewed uh, during the assessment of the NDA application. Uh, for non oligonucleotide related impurities that are present uh, in both the generic and ROD products, uh, the impurity levels in the generic product should not be higher than the level found in the uh, reference product. Otherwise, um, you would need to provide justification for why such impurities uh, will not impact the safety and efficacy of the product. Uh, for new oligonucleotide related impurities uh, only present in the generic product, uh, proper characterization and safety evaluation uh, should be performed to, prov to provide justification that the new impurity would not affect the safety and efficacy of the product. Um, so in addition, uh, we recommend that you develop, you know, uh, orthogonal uh, analytical methods are capable of resolving, you know, co-eluding impurities from the parent molecules. Thank you. Well, that's all the time we have for questions. A huge thank you to our panel for answering numerous questions that came in. We'll now transition in, uh, into a session two on drug device combination products with a focus on devices. First, we'll introduce our session leads, which include Dr. Stephanie Sokup, who joined FDA in 2018 as a primary reviewer in the Division of Clinical Review. Dr. Sokup routinely reviews comparative analysis, comparative clinical endpoint bioequivalent studies, as well as clinical consults and controls. Our second session lead is Dr. Catherine Phoebus, who's the lead medical officer for the drug device combination products team in OGD's Office of Research and Standards. Prior to joining ORS, Dr. Phoebus was the team leader for OGD's clinical safety team and worked as a medical officer in the Division of Clinical Review. Our first presentation in session two is on comparing device user interfaces and seeking advice in the pre-ANDA period. Our presenter, Dr. Katherine Hartka, joined FDA in 2020 as a pharmacologist in the Center for Tobacco Products Office of Science. 
She's currently a pharmacologist in the Division of Therapeutic Performance on the Device Evaluation Team. In her current role, Dr. Hardka is actively involved in developing product-specific guidances and addressing controlled correspondences and pre-ANDA meeting requests related to drug-device combination products. Next, our session lead, Dr. Stephanie Sokup, will present on conducting a comparative analysis when the R&D is not available. Our final presentation in session two is on the future challenges, electronic devices, Peters, impacts on generic drug development and substitution. Our presenter, Dr. Betsy Ballard, has worked at FDA for 12 years with time spent in CDRH, OND, and OGD as a medical officer reviewing applications for devices, drugs, and combination products. Please join me to welcome our first presenter, Dr. Phoebus. Good morning. My name is Katherine Hartka, and I'm a pharmacologist at FDA in the Office of Generic Drugs Office of Research and Standards. My talk today focuses on generic drug device combination products and is titled Comparing Device User Interface and Seeking Advice in the Pre-ANDA Period. After listening to this presentation, participants should be able to discuss how to seek regulatory advice for a proposed generic drug device combination product, understand principles for conducting comparative analyses for generic combination products, and lastly, identify factors that inform categorization of user interface differences as minor versus other design differences. To begin, I'd like to define what a drug device combination product is. Per the Code of Federal Regulations, a drug device combination product is composed of a drug constituent part and a device constituent part. For this presentation, we will be focusing on combination products in which the drug constituent operates as the primary mode of action. In a drug device combination product, the drug and device constituent parts may be integrated, co-packaged, or cross-labeled. And finally, when discussing generic drug device combination products, combination products may have simple or complex device constituents. I'd now like to expand upon the idea of complex generics, because many drug device combination products, but not all, are classified as complex generics. Shown here is the definition of complex products, which includes products with complex active ingredients, formulations, routes of delivery, or dosage forms. It also includes complex drug device combination products, including auto injectors and meter dose inhalers. And this is the class of products we'll primarily be focusing on today for this presentation. And complex products also include other products where complexity or uncertainty concerning the approval pathway would benefit from early scientific engagement. Complex generics can raise unique scientific and regulatory considerations and may be more difficult to develop. Combination products that are approved in an abbreviated new drug application, or ANDA, are generally considered to be therapeutically equivalent to the reference listed drug, or RLD. This means that a generic combination product is expected to have the same clinical effect and safety profile as the RLD when administered to patients under the use conditions specified in the labeling. However, a generic combination product does not need to be identical to its RLD in all respects. Let's continue on the topic of generic drug device combination product substitutability. There are various considerations for substitutability that FDA considers, including bioequivalence and quality considerations. However, for this presentation, we're going to focus only on the consideration of device user interface. User interface is defined as all components of the product with which a user interacts and includes the delivery device constituent of the combination product, any associated components, and product labeling and packaging. And device user interface similarities and differences between the proposed generic and the RLD device are evaluated through comparative analyses. The FDA has developed this 2017 draft guidance for industry that provides a recommended approach to conducting comparative analyses and is available here at the link shown on the right. I will now go into more detail about components within the guidance on the next couple of slides. As I mentioned, the guidance provides a recommended approach for comparative analyses. Comparative analyses are really a tool for comparing the user interface 
of the proposed generic combination product to that of the RLD. And as you can see in this diagram, comparative analyses is comprised of three different analyses, a physical comparison, a comparative task analysis, and a labeling comparison. All three of these are necessary for complete comparative analyses and for FDA to fully assess device user interface substitutability of the proposed generic as compared to that of the RLD. Although the guidance provides recommendations for conducting comparative analyses, FDA also encourages applicants to contact the FDA prior to submitting an ANDA to discuss the proposed combination product. There are two methods to do this, through either a control correspondence or a product development meeting. And a control correspondence is submitted in order to seek information about a specific element of product development. And there are two types, a standard control correspondence, which will be referred to as a level one under GDUFA 3, has an FDA response period of 60 calendar days. A complex control correspondence, or a level two under GDUFA 3, involves evaluation of clinical content and as such has a longer review timeline of 120 days. In contrast, a product development meeting allows for discussion on multiple scientific issues and includes input from multiple disciplines regarding a proposed drug device combination product. The response period for a product development meeting is 120 days. Additionally, there is also specific guidance available online that provides information and instructions regarding these two avenues for contacting the FDA. In a device evaluation submitted through either a controlled correspondence or a product development meeting, a firm typically will submit a complete comparative analysis along with device samples of their proposed generic. Additionally, a firm may ask questions related to whether FDA agrees with the firm's conclusion from their comparative analyses. In response to questions such as these, FDA will complete their own independent comparative analyses, they will review the device samples, and also review the firm's comparative analyses. FDA may provide feedback regarding whether a proposed generic combination product may be substitutable for an RLD, and whether there may be other than minor design differences between a generic combination product user interface and the RLD that could warrant submission of additional data. And during the scientific review process of a control correspondence or pre and submission with device evaluation questions, FDA may require clarification on the device sample submitted or the firm's comparative analyses. And as such, FDA may reach out to the firm and request information in order to provide the most comprehensive and useful response to the firm's question. In a device evaluation submitted in either a control correspondence or a product development meeting, there are several steps a firm can take in order to help FDA provide the most useful response. First, FDA typically requests that a firm submit three to five samples of the proposed generic combination product that is as close to the 2D marketed version as possible. And in the submission, it is helpful for FDA to know whether the combination product is a prototype or a final version. If it is a prototype, please clearly identify planned differences of the prototype as compared to the 2B marketed version. Second, FDA typically requests one sample of the reference of the drug, although three samples are preferred to help facilitate the reviewer's independent evaluation. Third, FDA requests the complete and comprehensive comparative analyses report, which aids FDA's review. And I'll discuss in the next couple of slides what information should be included in the comparative analyses report. Lastly, it's also important that the firm submit specific questions about either the comparative analyses or device user interface that they would like addressed and for the FDA to repair, prepare a response to. Let's now go into more detail about each of the analyses included within comparative analyses and what exactly should be provided in your report. First, let's cover a physical comparison. A physical comparison should include the visual, auditory, and tactile examination of the physical features of the device user interfaces of the proposed generic product and the RLD. And FDA recommends that a firm actually acquire the RLD so that they can examine the physical features of their proposed generic as compared to the RLD. A list of physical features is shown here, although this list is not inclusive, but may include size, shape, texture, font size, and shape. A physical comparison should focus only on the external design mechanisms of the device constituent and any features that the end user will interact with. And in the physical comparison section of the comparative analysis report, 
a firm should clearly identify, characterize, and provide justification for any differences noted between the proposed generic and the RLD. Next, let's move on to the comparative task analysis. In a comparative task analysis, a firm should systematically analyze and compare step-by-step -step processes for drug administration using the proposed generic and RLD devices. I've included an example on the bottom of this slide of what a typical comparative task analysis might look like. In a task analysis, all steps should be identified that end users need to perform in order to administer the product. And this is reflected in the left-hand column of the table. Often, this information can be obtained from the RLD instructions for use. However, it's important to note that the task analysis should not be focused on labeling, but rather on the device tasks. Next, any differences between tasks of the proposed generic as compared to the RLD should be noted and analyzed with reference to physical design features. This is indicated in the right-hand column of the table, which clearly, which clearly states the differences noted. And you'll note in this example that the priming symbol, symbol in the dose counter of the proposed generic has a different design as compared to the RLD. And this is noted during the task analysis. However, this design difference is not expected to impact a user's ability to properly execute the task and is stated such in the table. The last component of the comparative analyses which we'll discuss is a labeling comparison. In the ANDA submission, your labeling comparison should include side-by-side, line-by-line, figure-by-figure comparison of all labeling components of the proposed generic as compared to the RLD. And this includes the full prescribing information, instructions for use, device labels, and packaging. However, for pre and device evaluations, which again are submitted in a control correspondence or product development meeting, the labeling comparison should focus only on the instructions for use, but should still include a side-by-side, line-by-line, figure-by-figure comparison. It's important in your labeling comparison to identify, characterize, and justify differences between the proposed generic and the RLD labeling. In general, generic product labeling should be the same as that of the RLD, although some differences are permissible as discussed further in the regulations. Labeling differences that stem from permissible differences in design between the user interface of the proposed generic product and the RLD may fall within the scope of permissible differences in labeling for a product approved under an ANDA. The physical comparison, comparative task analysis, and labeling comparison each has an outcome, which includes either no difference, minor design difference, or other design difference. And it's important to consider any identified differences in the context of the overall risk profile of the product. For the remainder of the presentation, I will go into more detail on other and minor design differences. We've reached our first challenge question. Which of the following statements is not true? A, generic combination products must be identical to the RLD in all respects. B, labeling comparisons assessed in pre and submissions focus on the instructions for use. C, the device user interface is a consideration for generic substitutability. D, the device user interface includes all components the end user interacts with. The correct answer is A. As I previously mentioned, Comparative analyses should clearly state the outcomes of the comparison, which may include no design differences, minor design differences, or other design differences. Shown here is the definition of a minor design difference and another design difference per the 2017 draft guidance for industry that I previously showed. A minor design difference is a difference in the user interface of the proposed generic product in comparison to the RLD user interface that does not affect an external critical design attribute. In contrast, the other design difference is an aspect of the comparative analyses that suggests differences in the design of the user interface of a proposed generic product as compared to the RLD user interface may impact an external critical design attribute that involves administration of the product. On this slide, I've provided some examples of some design differences that may be classified as minor. Although please keep in mind that these examples and situations described would be assessed on an ANDA specific basis. Some of these examples include differences in the color scheme of the device constituent that would not result in confusion to the end user with other product strengths. Minor differences in dimensions of the device constituent that would not impact the end user, such as making it more difficult to grasp or handle the device. 
generic drug name substitution on the device in lieu of the RLD name. And lastly, some changes in dose counter that would not impact readability to the populations that use the product, such as changes in font size, style, or color. However, smaller font size or decreased contrast between the text and the background would likely reduce readability and may be viewed as an other design difference. Now, on this slide, I provided some examples of design differences that might be classified as other, and this includes the introduction of a new task for end users to complete in order to administer the proposed generic drug that was not required with the RLD, a change in the cleaning procedure that results in different requirements for disassembly of the generic product compared to the RLD, and lastly, a change in task that results in a manual push for drug delivery of a generic pen device rather than automated drug delivery mechanism for the RLD. Overall, you can see that these examples either introduce new tasks that the RLD did not have, or there is a change to the RLD tasks. And again, these would be addressed on an ANDA-specific basis. In conclusion, other design differences may increase risk to end users or would require additional training from the healthcare provider for an end user to use the product safely and effectively. When categorizing whether a design difference is minor or other, the end usage scenario is important to consider. Provided on this slide are several considerations that should be thought about as you are conducting your comparative analyses and during the categorization process. First, urgency of use. Will the device be used in an emergency situation, such as an emergency inhaler, or is it used every day for chronic conditions? Second, what is the frequency of use? Is the product only going to be used once or will it be used repeatedly? Third, who are the end users? Is the product used exclusively by patients and caregivers or do healthcare providers administer the product? We know that healthcare providers may be more accustomed to navigating differences in device design. Fourth, what is the environment of use? For instance, is it being used in a clinic or hospital setting and administered by a healthcare provider? Or is it being used at home by an elderly adult? Fifth, what is the patient population? So who will be using it? What is their age, their range of motion, and fine motor coordination? It's important to consider all of these factors, not only when the drug product is being administered, but for all tasks, including priming, cleaning, and storing the device. Let's go through an example that highlights the importance of considering the end user. Let's pretend that a proposed generic inhaler is submitted for review. In the physical comparison, the reviewer notes that the proposed generic has a reach height that is taller than the reach height of the RLD. Although there are no new tasks that have been introduced or changed in the task analysis, without also considering the end user, it would be easy to gloss over the difference in reach height. Do you think that the difference in reach height would be more concerning if this inhaler was an emergency inhaler used by pediatric patients who typically have small hands? or if this was a maintenance inhaler used by adults. I hope that you can see in this example that a change in reach height may be more concerning and could be classified as an other design difference in the first scenario, as opposed to perhaps a minor design difference in the second scenario. Although please keep in mind that a situation like this would be assessed on an ANDA specific basis. If other design differences are noted after conducting comparative analyses, the 2017 guidance for industry has several recommendations. First, an applicant may consider modifying the design of the device constituent part in order to minimize differences. Alternatively, FDA may request that a firm provide additional data or information that includes comparative use human factor studies, in vivo studies, in vitro studies, or published literature. This information should support or justify that differences will not alter the overall risk profile when generic substitution occurs. And prior to conducting a comparative use human factor study, a firm may contact FDA in order to discuss the other design differences through either a control correspondence or a product development meeting. I'd like to conclude my presentation by discussing some ongoing research in this field. The category, categorization of minor versus other design differences is a research focus for FDA. And FDA has funded and collaborated with external researchers to support the categorization of differences in the design of the user interface and to explore in vitro or in vivo approaches to assess other design differences as alternatives to comparative use human factor studies. 
Future research may include FDA-designed comparative use human factor studies to evaluate certain types of differences and the impacts on user error rates. It is anticipated that outcomes from these studies will be published in order to support the generic drug industry in designing comparative use human factor studies. Additionally, outcomes may revise FDA's thinking about whether certain differences are minor or other. We've now reached our final challenge question. Which of the following statements is true? A, patient and caregivers may be accustomed to navigating differences in user interfaces more so than healthcare providers. B, firms should not communicate with FDA regarding their proposed generic product prior to ANDA submission. C, minor design differences are generally acceptable, but should be identified and justified in comparative analyses. And D, FDA expects that end users can substitute the generic product with additional training from a healthcare provider. The answer is C. I'd now like to summarize the main take home points from this presentation. First, a proposed generic combination product does not need to be identical to the RLD in all respects, and any differences should be identified and justified in comparative analyses. Second, the end usage scenario of the proposed generic product should be considered when assessing design differences and categorizing them as either minor versus other. Lastly, engage early with FDA in order to request feedback on the proposed generic combination product design and user interface. Thank you for listening. That concludes my presentation. Good morning, and thank you for joining me to discuss the approach to a comparative analysis when the RLD is unavailable. In today's discussion, we will review the importance of comparing a proposed product to the reference listed drug, or RLD, discuss the general approach to conducting comparative analyses when the RLD is not available, and review an example of how to approach comparative analyses with a discontinued RLD. To start, when developing a generic drug product, that product must establish therapeutic equivalence. That means it can be expected to have the same clinical effect and safety profile when administered to patients under the conditions specified in the labeling. These expectations are the same for generic drug device combination products. The FDA considers whether end users can use the generic combination product when it is substituted for the reference listed drug without the intervention of the healthcare professional and or without additional training prior to use of the generic combination product. But keep in mind that the generic and RLD products do not need to be identical as long as the differences do not preclude approval under an abbreviated new drug application. When conducting a comparative analysis, one must compare the user interface of the generic product to the user interface of the RLD. Please remember all determinations of sameness under Section 505J refer to the RLD. When the RLD information is unavailable, it can be challenging to conduct the comparative analysis, but it's still required to make the comparison to the RLD. As always, further details and guidance can be found in the Comparative Analyses and Related Comparative Use Human Factors Studies Guidance. When an RLD is unavailable, there can be several challenges. For labeling, if the RLD was discontinued several years ago, there may not be an IFU for comparison. In the physical comparison, if the product is discontinued, there are likely no samples available. In the comparative task analysis, the proposed container closure may be different than that of the RLD, which makes the comparison difficult especially if RLD samples cannot be obtained. Let's move on to our approach. As discussed in the previous presentation, the comparative analyses are composed of three parts, the labeling comparison, physical comparison, and the comparative task analysis. Remember that unlike comparative bioequivalence testing, the comparative analyses are the same whether or not the RLD is available on the market. 
The RLD product label is the most important first step for comparative analyses when the RLD is not available. You should always use the most current version of the RLD label. And remember, the labeling comparison should focus on IFU and other sections related to the user interface. The first place to look for labeling is drugs at FDA. Most labeling should be there even for discontinued products. But a controlled correspondence can be submitted requesting the most recently approved label. All approved RLD labeling is available from FDA's Division of Freedom of Information. When conducting the physical comparison without actual samples, first look to the label again for any images or sketches. Whether are actual images or descriptions representative of the product. Next, look for documents supporting RLD approval. Technical drawings or sketches may be present. Additional resources, such as RLD promotional materials, can also be helpful as long as the materials represent the U.S. marketed product. Lastly, general knowledge of common container closures can be helpful. We all have a basic idea of what certain products look like. For example, a syringe or dual port IV bag, even if we don't have an image or a sample of that product. For the task comparison, remember, the objective is not to rewrite the IFU. Ideally, the tasks described here should include all steps to use the product from opening the packaging to disposing of the product. So, if the RLD product is not in front of you, most of the tasks to use that product can be determined from other sources. The first of which is the general container closure. Similar to the physical comparison, we know the basic steps to use many types of those common container closures. For example, if the RLD was a single dose glass vial, one must first remove a cap, clean the top of the vial, use a syringe with needle to draw up the liquid, then administer to the patient. An oral cup is also fairly intuitive. One must first remove the cap of a bottle, pour the desired amount into the cup, and administer. Additional details of the container closure description can also be found in the RLD label. In the How Supplied section, for example, presence of a dust cap for a nasal spray bottle would be described here. And one of the steps to use that product would be to remove the dust cap. Also remember that if the proposed container closure is different from the RLD, all tasks described in the task comparison should reflect those differences. I want to emphasize that the primary comparison in comparative analyses should be to the RLD, not the reference standard or another marketed product. However, supportive information from other approved marketed products like the reference standard may be used. For example, if an RLD was a single dose vial and the proposed product will be a single dose pre-filled syringe and a search of the orange book shows that all currently approved and marketed products are single dose pre-filled syringes, similar features, this can be used to support the difference in container closure of the proposed product from the RLD. Now let's work our way through a detailed example. Our example is Atrovent Nasal Solution. This product was approved in 1995 for symptomatic relief of allergic and non-allergic rhinitis in children and adults. It was discontinued about four years ago, not for safety or effectiveness reasons. A quick search of drugs at FDA shows labeling for the RLD from 2007. If you noticed, the full labeling was from 2007 and a labeling supplement was later approved in 2011. For this product, the letter from that 2011 supplement details all changes to the labeling, 
which can be noted in the comparative analysis review, or the most up-to-date label can be requested from FDA. As I mentioned, the RLD product has been officially off the market for four years. Often, production is discontinued prior to the official discontinuation date, which makes these samples even more difficult to obtain. However, information can be obtained from the label. Images would be the most helpful, but in this case, let's say we've looked and found that there are no actual product images. Some additional clues can often be found in the House Supplied section as well as the IFU if it's present. In this case, there is an IFU. Within the House Supplied section, there's a detailed description of the product specifying a metered nasal spray pump, green safety clip, and clear plastic dust cap. In the IFU, there are sketched images. Although the sketches don't show the exact appearance of the product, one can determine the overall appearance and approximate proportions of the bottle and placement of the green safety clip. We now know that this overall appearance is consistent with the average nasal spray bottle. In other words, it doesn't appear to have any unexpected or unique features. So in the next section of our review, the task comparison, we have a standard appearing nasal spray bottle design based on our labeled product description and sketched images. We also have the IFU to outline the steps to use the RLD product. From here, we would compare these steps with those to use the proposed nasal spray bottle and outline any differences between the two. For example, a difference in the safety clip or dust cap. There are six currently marketed ipratropium bromide nasal spray products in the orange book. While we've already compared to the RLD, we can also examine the listed product labels, specifically the IFU, common physical features, etc., as additional support for the proposed product comparative analysis. In summary, all comparative analyses must compare the proposed generic product to the RLD. When RLD samples cannot be obtained to conduct the comparative analyses, use all information available, including descriptions and images in the RLD label, RLD descriptions in the approval package, as well as general knowledge of common container closures, such as glass vials and nasal closures. Such as glass. Now that we've applied the approach to an example, Let's try our challenge questions. Question number one, true or false? Proposed drug device combination product X is a prefilled syringe. The RLD, a glass vial, was discontinued 20 years ago. The comparative analyses must be conducted using the current RS, a prefilled syringe. The answer is false. The proposed product must be compared to the RLD. Question number two, true or false? Many of the tasks to use a device can often be determined from the RLD description, images in the RLD IFU, and images or descriptions in the documents to support RLD approval. The answer is true. So on your next comparative analyses, compare the proposed product with the RLD for all three parts, labeling, physical, and task. Use all available public information to find descriptions, sketches, and images to inform your analysis. Where able, design the generic product to minimize differences in user interface and critical tasks as compared to the RLD and engage early with FDA during product development via controlled correspondence and pre and a pathways for further guidance if necessary. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to 
Session 2, Drug Device Combination Products. My name is Betsy Ballard, and I'm a reviewer in the Division of Therapeutic Performance 1 on the device team. And I've been tasked with discussing future challenges in electronic devices, drug use-related software, and the impacts on generic development and substitution. So as a quick overview, I'm going to provide an example of an ele electronic device provide a background for digital health technology framework within the FDA, then give an example of some of the challenges that a generic drug development might face in this new digital world, and some of the policy changes that the agency is facing it, uh, to deal with the digital technology. So let's start with challenge one. That's an example of a unique electronic device. And for this, I've chosen Atasuve because it's a novel drug delivery platform where a pure active pharmaceutical ingredient, in this case, loxapine, is applied to a film within an inhaler that once, when it's breath actuated, produces a thermally generated aerosol that can be inhaled deep into the lungs and delivered to the systemic circulation. The next several series of slides will show some of the technological uh, differences related to this inhaler. Um, I'm going to briefly go over these quickly just to identify some of the key features of the device piece. So there's basically three parts to the device. You have an upper housing, which is plastic and it joins to the lower housing, and it allows for controlling and directing the airflow over the, of the vaporizing drug. You have the heat package, which is like the middle layer, and this consists of a drug coating on one side and the heat package on the lower side, which contains the thermite reactant that allows gener generation of the high temperatures to sublimate the aerosol product, and the lower housing, which contains the electronics that are responsible for the breath-actuated mechanism and initiation of the heat package. So the device contains a indicator light, which is a green light emitting diode. When the tab is pulled, the device will come on and turn green, indicating to the user that it's ready to be used. And once the, once the patient inhales the product, it automatically turns off and can be discarded because it's a single-use product. The user will tend to sense slightly warm air and a mildly warm outer surfaces of the, of the housing. The breath actuating mechanism consists of a slow flow switch, which is a thin foil strip that is cantilevered in position. During inhalation, air entering the port causes this lever to flip up and contact the electronics in the device to complete the circuit, actuate the heat package, and send the current that will initiate uh, generation of the temperatures required to aerosolize the product. Some of the device design parameters that need to be considered when designing this prod, pro, a product like this. The vaporization temperature, studies have shown that the ideal temperature is about 400 degrees centigrade for loxapine. But if other products are developed using this platform, there may be, it may be different. The thickness of the drug coating. Uh, because that has a direct effect on particle size. The aerosol parameters that we typically associate with inhalers, such as particle size, mean, mass median aerodynamic dynamometer, these are, seem to be important parameters to predict the percentage of the drug that will hit the target site. And this is consistent with this desi uh, inhaler design as well. Aerosol purity is less of an issue because this product does not contain any excipients, it's pure API. Some of the, what are the drug parameters that are important to consider for this platform? So because st staccato allows for use of only active ingredient, a lot of the Q1, Q2 issues rela relating to excipients um, are not as critical for developing a product for this platform. It generally works better with small molecules, um, less than 1,000 Daltons. Uh, as far as the state of the matter, solids work, seem to work better than liquids. Only nicotine has been shown to work with this design. 
the melting point needs to be considered because the device heats to 350 to 400 degrees centigrade so that heat sensitive chemicals and biologics would not be compatible with this program. If the drug exists in one, more than one crystalline shape, the effect of thermal aerosolization needs to be considered. And we know that the coated dose weight and coating area need to be controlled to, deter, for, uh, to show bioequivalence. So what are the challenges with Atasu? Well, certainly selection of appropriate drugs for use with the platform. Currently, only loxapine is approved. And how do you determine bioequivalence using this, plant, using this product? Well, certainly the device parameters have to be taken into account when you're developing a generic version, as do the drug parameters. But also, you need to look at the heating and delivery of the drug that has a systemic effect. As always, with a new drug, there are patent issues that have not yet expired that would need to be considered or require workarounds at this time. Now we'll move to challenge two. What is digital health? We all have an under, uh, understanding in our mind of what digital health, and there's certainly been a plethora of published articles relating to this topic. In 2013, CDRH issued the first guidance on device software functions and mobile medical applications. It was revised again in 2019 and defines a mobile medical app that in, anything that incorporates device software functionality that meets the definition of a device and can be used as, as an accessory to a regulated medical device or to transform a platform into a met regulated medical device. In 2022, CDRH stood up the Center for Digital Health Excellence to empower stakeholders to advance healthcare by fostering responsible and high quality digital health information to share knowledge among various st stakeholders and promote innovative regulatory approaches. And the critical thing is that for medical product development tools, there is a conclusion that the level of validation associated with the tool is sufficient to support its context of use or that it is fit for its purpose, intended purpose. So what is digital health technology? And that's a broad, definite, broad umbrella and there's a lot of things that can be, people tend to consider under the broad term digital health technology. The slide lists some of them. The remote sensing and wearables we're probably all familiar with. Fitbit would be a prime example. Um, but some of the point of care testing can also um, fit into this category. A lot of these are platforms such as digital health medical records or patient physician portals or telemedicine and health, really not regulated by the FDA because those are most mostly in the purview of the practice of medicine. However, such things as do-it-yourself diagnostics, treatments, decision support systems, and certainly in the field of imaging, digital health information technology has been extremely important. The digital health technology is defined as a system that uses competing computing platforms, connectivity, software, and sensors for healthcare and related use. A subcategory of this is prescription drug use related software or PDURs, which refers to software disseminated by or on behalf of a drug sponsor that accompanies one or more of the sponsor's prescription drugs. And I will talk a little bit more about this later on in the, in the presentation. So what is the status of digital health? In a recently published article by Day et al., they looked at what is going on in the field of digital health. And they found that it, it may be used to differentiate between two major themes. One is the, one of the claims that uh, preventing disease, or improved compliance, improvement disease status, sort of the clinical type claims versus the promotional claims, such as those saying, oh, improve patient engagement, uh, economic savings to the system. But what they found was most digital health companies have a low level of clinical robustness and haven't been able to make any clinical claims in their labeling. They found that only about 20% of the firms were able to support their claims through rigorously tested trials. In addition, there are issues related to confidentiality, security, and data privacy that have not been fully addressed by industry. And finally, there are multiple stakeholders that need to be convinced to see the value of any given product or service. 
This is a very busy slide, and it just lists the CDRH, some of the CDRH references that are available about software and medical device accessories. With that, we're going to move into challenge three, which is the generic development of drug-led drug device combination products, or DDCPs, with prescription drug use related software, or PDORs. So what is the DDCP? From the earlier presentation by Dr. Hartka, you should pretty have, have a pretty good understanding of this. But I'm going to redefine it here again as a combination product that contains a drug constituent part and a device constituent part. It can be marketed as a single entity, such as an inhaler. It can be co-packaged, where the tray contains everything required to administer the product. Or it can be cross-labeled, where the reference product label calls out a specific device, and the device label calls out a specific drug. So let's define PDORs a little further. This is prescription drug use related software. It's software that is disseminated by or on behalf of a drug sponsor and accompanies one of the sponsor's drugs that is a drug-led DDCP. The PDORs function has a distinct purpose, is the distinct purpose of the software. It can pair to a mobile app with the drug device combination product. It can communicate information to the end user, such as the patient, the health care provider, or the caregiver. It can track and display drug administration, such as ingestion, injection, or inhalation events. And it can have more than one function. Some of these new softwares specifically are targeted to assist individuals in their own health and wellness management. Other software functions can be targeted to healthcare providers as tools to improve and facilitate delivery of patient care. So we have an independent or integrated PDORs. Software that is a device constituent part or element of a drug led DDCP, such as software that would capture data on ingestion of a drug from an embedded sensor in an oral tablet. Being able to capture the injection data from an auto injector to a display in an app, or capturing inhalation data from an inhaler and then display it in an app. These would all be examples of, of an ind integrated PDORs. However, not all software is a device constituent part or an element of a drug-led DDCP. Those apps that allow a user to input health information related to their condition for which they were prescribed, such as information that might be put in an e-diary, which can be used during new drug development at, in a clinical trial, or information regarding pollen count or weather website, or a copy of the prescribing information or instructions for use. These would not be considered device constituent parts. But PDORs provided in a drug-led DDCP can have both types of software. So the DigiHaler is an example of a DDCP with a PDORs. The information can be captured with the app and includes such things as a record of the number of times that it was used, the quality of the inhalations, and can show patterns over time that the user may wish to share with their healthcare provider. Other sensors, types of sensors that are being developed would be things such as a sweat sensor or a saliva sensor or even an exhaled breath analysis. And these sensors will capture data that can then be analyzed by a smartphone. But none of these have been approved as of yet. So that leads us to challenge four. What, are the, what policies and guidances is, are CEDAR, is CEDAR developing to deal with the digital health world? So in the PDUFA 7 commitment letter, the agency agreed to establish a cedar CBER Committee on Digital Health. Uh, the Office of New Drugs and the Division of Clinical Outcome Assessments is, ha, is looking at the use of technology to collect clinical outcomes during clinical trials. They some of these sensors can measure traditional efficacy endpoints more accurately or more reliably, but they, require, but they require validation. And they can even measure endpoints that were not previously possible. Finally, CEDAR is developing the guidance for PDORs, which is expected to be published 
and you're asked to keep an eye out for that. With regards to generic products with the Pudors, the best advice I can give you at this time is if you're developing a generic with a software that the RLD does not have, or you're proposing not to include software that the RLD does have, early engagement with the FDA will allow for a case-by-case -case evaluation and help with your product development. As always, when you combine a drug product with AI, you run the risk of intellectual property concerns. And certainly, in the generic world, comparative analysis is the critical piece to help determine bioequivalence. Uh, performing a use-related risk analysis may be helpful during design development, but ultimately, in, with the ANDA submission, it is the comparative analysis that will be, continue to be critical to determine substitutability with the, new, with the new generic product. So this is just a listing of some of the CEDAR resources that are available. And now we'll move on to the challenge questions. So how is CEDAR responding to a digital world? A, making PDUFA commitments, B, developing a guidance, C, A and B, or D, none of the above? And the answer here is C. And challenge question two, what is the best way to engage with FDA for a generic product that has a PDURS? Um, you can develop the software independently. You can submit controlled correspondences and pre-meeting, pre and the development meeting requests. You can seek input and advice early in the drug development process? And the answer here again is C. Um, through controlled correspondences and pre and development meeting requests, questions can be answered and in, 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 in problems can be addressed in the pre-mark, in the pre-submission phase, and coming in early will help facilitate that. So in summary, digital health technology is a rapidly developing field with many new challenges. It does provide the opportunity for not use of novel endpoints in clinical trials, but it requires a multidisciplinary approach and a collaborative approach. Ideally, it can allow us to become more patient-centered in our drug development processes. For the generic drug program, CEDA recommends that you watch for the publication of the PDURS guidance, that you seek input and advice early in the drug development process, or as I like to say, come early and come often. With that, I'd like to acknowledge the following people across the various centers of the agency who helped with this presentation. And thank you. And this completes my talk. Thank you for the great presentation. Starting out with our first presentation by Dr. Hardka. We'll now transition into our session, Q, session two Q&A panel. If you haven't had a chance to submit your questions into the Q&A chat pod, please do so now. We'll answer as many time, questions as time allows. To the Q&A panel, we welcome Lisa Burkew, who joined OGD in 2016 and is a regulatory counsel in the Office of Generic Drug Policy, where she focuses on issues related to combination products. Also, we welcome Dr. Markham Luke, who serves as FDA Supervisory Physician and Director of the Division of Therapeutic Performance One in the Office of Research and Standards at OGD. Dr. Luke has been at FDA since 1998, serving in various roles, including as the Lead Medical Officer for Dermatology Drugs in the Office of New Drugs at CEDAR, Chief Medical Officer and Deputy Director for the Office of Device Evaluation and CDRH and as Acting Director for Cosmetics and the Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition. In addition, we welcome Commander Andrew Fine, who's a Senior Advisor in OGD's Office of Safety and Clinical Evaluation, Division of Clinical Review. As part of the Division's management team, Commander Fine provides clinical, regulatory, and process oversight for ANDA and pre-ANDA activities in the division. Prior to his role as senior advisor, Commander Fine served as a team leader in the division for seven years. Finally, we welcome back session lead, Dr. Catherine Phoebus, to our session two Q&A panel. Looks like we have some questions coming in right now. 
And the first question will be directed to Dr. Katherine Hartka. And here is the first question. What is the mechanism for submitting device samples associated with a controlled correspondence? And are these requested by the agency with shipping instructions? And if so, does the time required to obtain the devices affect the response time? Great question, thank you. So device samples for control correspondence can be sent in with the applicant's submission, and you can contact the project manager or control correspondence staff in order to obtain the address. If the device samples are not sent in with the original control correspondence submission, they will be requested by the agency through an information response or IR. And the time at which the agency actually receives the device samples and the complete submission package is when the response time will start. Thank you for responding to that question. We do have another question for Dr. Hartka. And here is the question. Where should applicants include information regarding considerations for assessing differences in the comparative analysis doc document itself or a separate type of risk assessment document in their application? So the considerations for assessing differences does not actually need to be included as a separate section in the report. But this is something that an applicant should keep in mind when they're conducting the comparative analyses and consider who the end user is when assessing whether they think a difference may be minor versus other. You may incorporate these considerations into your conclusions or the scientific rationale for whether you believe a design difference is minor versus other. Thank you for responding to that question. Moving on to our next panelist, we do have a question, a couple of questions for Dr. Stephanie Sokup. And here's the first question for Dr. Sokup. For ophthalmic droppers, if the RLD is discontinued, can the current designated RS product be used for comparison? For a discontinued ophthalmic as well, you do your best to compare to the RLD using information from the labeling and whatever other information is, is available. If you can't obtain the physical comparator, then you can use the RS as supportive information. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We do have another question for Dr. Sokup. Here is the question. If very little information is known about an RLD appearance and a generic product is already being developed, what is the best avenue to pursue feedback on that design? The most appropriate avenue would for feedback would be the control or preanda pathways. You should include all information you do have for the RLD and include as much information possible on the proposed product, uh, both for design and labeling. Thank you for responding to that question. Moving on to our next panelist, we did have a question come in for Betsy Ballard, Dr. Betsy Ballard. And here's the first question for Dr. Ballard. Is a drug device combination product with digital components considered a complex product under GDUFA? So let me start by saying that a lot of this is going to be determined on a case by case basis, but the policy will be is being developed and once it's once the guidance is published we can certainly be much more specific in our responses to this question generally speaking intuitively it would appear that if there's a drug device combination with the pedours it would be considered a complex drug device combination product at this time Thank you for responding to that question. Moving on to our next panelist, we have a question come in for Lisa Berku, and here is the first question. What are some of the GDUFA 3 enhancements that will impact combination products? 
Yeah, so under the GDUFA 3 commitment letter, which is going to cover those fiscal years 2023 to 2027, um, we've agreed to expand the types of controls we'll review. And so, for example, applicants are now going to be able to submit controls after a complete response letter, after a tentative approval, and after ANDA approval. Um, applicants of complex drug device combination products are eligible for that pre and meeting program. And after a complete response letter, they could submit a post-CRL scientific meeting to seek advice on a new comparative use human factor study. And so we really recommend that folks review that commitment letter and be on the lookout for communications in the coming weeks. Thank you for responding to that question. Moving on to our next panelist, we do have a question that came in for Dr. Markham Luke, and here's the question for Dr. Luke. Should an ANDA applicant work to identify outstanding patents for the device constituents during or prior to its development process? Hi. Um, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. I think um, uh, and during the development process, it would be important to identify how the, uh, the device is designed and the patent, uh, public patent information can give some information about that. Um, and also uh, whether the patents are active or not may factor into uh, some design uh, discussions with your engineers uh, when you do design your uh, device constituent for, for the generic product. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We're moving on to our next panelist. Uh, we have a question that came in from Commander Andrew Fine, and here's the question for Commander Fine. Are simple ophthalmic dropper bottles considered as devices? And if so, is, it com is comparative analysis required for ANDA submission? Hello, thank you for that question. Yes, we are requesting complete comparative analyses for RLDs and proposed ANDAs that have an ophthalmic dropper presentation. Um, the, the, the recommendations outlined in the, in the talks today, as well as our comparative analysis guidance, would apply to an ophthalmic dropper. Additionally, a common question that has come up for ophthalmic droppers is the presence of a, a tamper evident plastic ring that is retained on the bottleneck for certain ophthalmic droppers. Um, this tamper evident feature may differ between a proposed generic as well as an RLD, and those differences should be outlined in any relevant comparative analysis that's comparing the proposed product to that RLD. So if the proposed product has a plastic has a tamper evident plastic ring that's retained, but the RLD may have a plastic shrink sleeve over the over the cap, that should be identified as a difference in your comparative analysis as part of a physical difference as well as if there's any related task differences that amount from that physical difference and those and just like any difference that's identified that difference should be classified appropriately with proper justification whether you whether the applicant considers that a minor difference or an other design difference thank you very much thank you for responding to that question we have another question that came in from commander fine and here is the question at the time of submitting an ANDA for generic product with an auto injector, if the RLD upgrades the auto injector design and discontinues the older design, most likely for business reasons, can the ANDA applicant still submit the ANDA with comparative analysis versus the older design? And in the case where there are differences due to the design differences in the user interface, is a human factors study needed? Thank you for this question as well. The scenario outlined in this question relates to, not, not related to the RLD discontinued, but the RLD has changed its design. Therefore, an ANDA submission reference that RLD must be compared to the, the most recent labeling and design device design that has, been, that has been approved by the agency under the RLD for that comparison. Um, 
and just like any other comparative analyses, you know, performing those three labeling, physical, and test comparisons will identify any differences and following classification of those differences as minor or other. Um, the justifications include, should include whether additional information and or data would be required. If there are questions about specifically what types of data may be necessary for an identified differences, obviously we encourage early communication with agency via preanda or controlled correspondence. But, but just to, to recap quickly, if the RLD changes its design, the original design would not deem that RLD discontinued, but the, the proposed generic still needs to be compared to that RLD and the most recently approved RLD with that updated design. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. Moving on to our next panelist. Got a couple of questions directed to Dr. Catherine Fibus. And here is the first question. How does the CEDAR initiatives to assist OGD with Peters digital technology? Sorry, can you repeat that one more time? I'll be happy to. Here's the question. How does the CEDAR initiatives to assist OGD with Peter's digital technology? Thank you so much for that question. So at this time, um, CEDAR is developing um, a per a prescription drug use related software guidance, as um, Dr. Ballard mentioned in her presentation. And there is a lot of cross center effort underway to develop guidance and policy to address development of um, products, especially drug device combination products that incorporate digital technologies. At this stage, um, because we have not seen a lot of new drug product approvals with these digital technologies, it will be a case by case basis as generic um, as the generic drug industry decides to move forward with developing generic versions of digital products that currently exist um, because this is an early phase of policy development uh, for CEDAR. At this stage, um, some of the considerations relate to some of the other uh, questions that we've seen come in and some of the issues that Dr. Ballard discussed, um, such as when these digital components um, are pro promotional supportive pieces versus whether they have been integrated into the data that support efficacy and, tech, uh, efficacy and safety of a particular new drug. So at this point, we really recommend that if you are developing a product that incorporates various types of digital elements, that you come speak to us in the pre and phase of development to get the best and most current advice about how to proceed with your development program. Um, and as mentioned earlier in the presentations, please do watch for um, please do watch for new materials and guidance being posted in this space and we look forward to working with you thank you for responding to that question we do have one more question for dr fibus and here's the question for an rld pen injector with no push button extension would a generic device with push button extension be considered as an other design difference? Thank you very much for this question. Um, we are seeing a lot of activity in the injection pen space. And for those attendees who may not be working on these particular devices right now, I believe this question is related to um, injection pens where you can dial a dose. And when you dial a dose, um, some injection pen designs um, 
there's a there's a dose barrel and some of them will extend out sort of like an extending plunger on a syringe as you dial up that dose and then in order to for the patient or the healthcare provider to administer the dose um, you push down on the dose button at the top of that extended plunger area or dose barrel in order to push the medication out of the injection pen through the needle into the patient. Um, other injection pens have been designed with an internal mechanism that when you dial the dose up, it actually loads a mechanism inside. And when you push the button, it releases that mechanism and the mechanism actually administers the drug and pushes it out rather than um, the patient or the user of the injection pen doing that. At this time, um, these design differences are being presented to us and are early enough that we don't have enough data to clearly understand whether this device user interface difference um, increases the risk for user errors if a patient receives a generic version of an injection pen product that has a difference in design with regards to whether this dose barrel extends when you dial the dose or not. It does change the way that a patient carries out that task of administering the drug. And so at this point, we are identifying this design difference as an other difference because we don't have enough data either in the published literature space or that has been reviewed internally to help us understand whether this particular design difference increases the risk for medication errors when generic substitution occurs. As we collect more data, we will continually reevaluate our thinking on this particular design issue but at this point, we do consider it another design difference. Thank you for responding to that question. Moving back up to the top of our panel, we have a couple more questions that came in for Dr. Katherine Hardka. And here's the first question. What should a firm submit to FDA if their proposed generic has the exact same design platform as the RLD. Excellent question. So a complete and comprehensive comparative analysis still needs to be submitted um, and any differences should be documented and justified. Once again, a comparative analysis includes a labeling comparison, physical comparison, and task analysis. And if you have any specific questions about a particular product you're in the process of developing, Please submit those questions via a control correspondence or a pre and meeting request. Thank you for responding to that question. We do have another question for Dr. Hartka. Here's the question. What is the preferred template for a CA report? So there's currently not a preferred template for comparative analyses. However, your report should clearly distinguish between the physical comparison, the comparative analyses, or I'm sorry, the physical comparison, the task comparison, and the labeling comparison components. Um, oftentimes, this information will be presented in a table format, and these tables should be clearly identified to distinguish the RLD from the proposed generic. Additionally, if your product has multiple um, strengths, it's helpful to separate these into separate subreports. And any photographs that are used in the physical comparison should be clear and detailed and contain colored photographs. Um, please make sure that the labeling comparison is in high resolution so that the text and images can be clearly viewed. Thank you for responding to that question. We have one more question for Dr. Hartka, and here is the question. When will an update be published for the draft guidance for conducting comparative analysis? Thank you for that question. Um, so the guidance is currently being updated. FDA has reviewed public comments submitted to the docket and based on feedback and current scientific thinking, the guidance will be revised accordingly. Thank you. 
Moving on to our next panelist, we did have a couple more questions come in for Dr. Stephanie Sokup. And here is the first question. In what section of the ANDA is the comparative analysis typically included? The comparative analyses and assessment should be placed in the E Common Technical Document section M5.3.5.4, which is the other study reports and related information section. Thanks. Thank you for responding to that question. We do have another question for Dr. Sokup. And here is the question. If pieces of RLD information are unknown, should that be conveyed in the CA? You should include all of the information that you do have and state in each pertinent section of the comparative analysis review where information could not be found. So, for example, if you don't have the actual sample or an image of the product, you might mention this in the physical comparison and possibly the comparative task analysis. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We're moving on to our next to uh, Dr. Markham Luke. We just had a question come in for Dr. Luke, and here is the question: Are there any recommendations with regard to identifying potential manufacturers or suppliers for the device constituent for generic combination drug products? Uh, that's an interesting question, but the. Um, the answer from FDA is uh, no, FDA does not provide any specific recommendations for manufacturers. Uh, however, uh, in, in consideration for which manufacturer um, a, a drug manufacturer may want to partner with to manufacture uh, the device constituent, uh, they should keep in mind GMP considerations and uh, the fact that that manufacturing facility is subject to uh, listing and um, and user fees. Thank you. Thank you for responding to Thanks that question. Respond. We do have another question for Dr. Luke. And here is the question. For combination products, do you need to apply for an ANDA or a 510K? Uh, that's a uh, another interesting question. I think uh, for, for combination products that are uh, with the drug primary mode of action, uh, and it's a generic to a reference product, the answer is that an ANDA is the most appropriate ap uh, application route. Uh, however, if the um, uh, manufacturer wishes to manufacture the device constituent and market that separately, uh, that may fall under uh, a device regulations uh, under 21 CFR 800, and uh, therefore they would uh, submit a 510K or um, uh, other dr device application as appropriate. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We've got time just for one more question, and the final question we'll have is directed to Commander Andrew Fine, and here is the question. In the example that you provided, if the RLD was a vial, which is discontinued, the RS is a PF PFS, and the proposed generic is also a PFS. Isn't it more pragmatic to compare a PFS proposed generic to a PFS RS rather than an RLD vial? Thank you for this question. Um, and just as a re is really as a reminder that for the comparative analysis, the proposed product has to be compared to the RLD, even if the RLD is is different it's different than that um proposed generic and there may be an approved and or a reference standard that is is more similar to that, that proposed product um in their comparative analysis after doing your comparisons to that vial in this case example if there is an approved and with a pre-filled in a pre-filled syringe that information and additional comparison can be used as supportive information um in your comparative analyses um but the comparison needs to be compared ultimately compared to the RLD with that supportive information from any approved ANDA that you feel would support your comparative analysis. Thank you.
That's all the time we have for questions. A huge thank you to panelists.